uh, people can lie to themselves. Like how many times have mm -hmm. you guys trained right. people and they're over training, they're under eating and you're like, so how do you feel? Oh, I feel great. I love it. You know, this is all working out great for me. And you're like, wait, I don't know if you really know what feeling good feels like. You feel hyper, uh, you feel lots of cortisol, which gives you a certain kind of energy, but maybe you don't necessarily feel better. So I like feeling better once a person is really in tune, but yeah. it's so subjective. Whereas, you know, if you had 10 pounds of the bar, you had a 10 pounds of the bar. It's pretty clear. If you did five more reps, you did five more reps. And if your diet is off, if your training is off, if your sleep is bad, it's hard to see strength gains when those things it's are It's a great off. metric, yeah, because you can just trick yourself all day with, like, your energy levels or, you know, how well you're doing in the gym. Other than, like, strength being that one thing that consistently, if you're seeing progress uh, or you're not seeing progress, yes. that's how you need to kind of adjust. And also maybe refocus what you're doing so you can get strong in a different direction than what you're doing before that. Hey, real quick, we're going to continue with the show. We got some cool stuff coming up, but real quick, I want to give away a workout program. I'm going to give away Map Strong right now. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. Do all those things, and then if we like your comment, we'll notify you, and you'll get free access to Map Strong. Also, there's only 48 hours left for our April sale. Maps Prime, Maps Prime Pro, and Maps Anywhere. If you got all three, normally would retail for $361. But for the next 48 hours, it's $99.99. That's it. So $99.99 gets you access to Maps Prime, Maps Prime Pro, Maps Anywhere. If you want to sign up, go to mapsapril.com. All right, here comes the rest of the show. One of the easiest and best ways to know whether or not you're doing the right kind of training, eating the right kind of diet, and leading the best lifestyle is if you're getting stronger. It's really hard to get stronger when you're doing one of those things wrong. Do you do you think this Can't is the, it. the single best indicator if you're on the right track, or do you think there's other things that are, you know, are superior to it? There's Nothing's perfect, right? Because mm -hmm. you could definitely get stronger um, and do other stuff wrong. It's just hard to get stronger and not feed yourself enough or get poor sleep or overtrain or undertrain. Um, it's also not perfect because as you progress, if you're advanced, you can't always look at strength. Strength gains eventually right. slow down and stop. I would say, you know, how you feel is probably better. The problem with that is it's so subjective. Yeah. Whereas strength is like, oh yeah, I added five pounds to the bar. Like yeah. it's very clear cut. Not only that, there's a there's a lot of things that could make you feel better. Like your your attitude and mood and like other things. You could be having a terrible program, but life is good. You just had yeah. incredible sex last night. You got a promotion at your job. Like you just you start to look at everything a lot yeah. different. So I don't like that one. I think I think strength is is more. It clear. could also be that like uh, people can lie to themselves. Like how many times have mm -hmm. you guys trained right. people and they're over training, they're under eating, and you're like, so how do you feel? Oh, I feel great. I love it. You know, this is all <laughs> working out great for me. And you're like, wait, I don't know if you really know what yeah. feeling good feels like. You feel hyper. Uh, you feel lots of cortisol, which gives you a certain kind of energy, but maybe you don't necessarily feel better. So I like feeling better once a person is really in tune, but yeah. it's so subjective. Whereas, you know, if you had 10 pounds of the bar, you had a 10 pounds of the bar, it's pretty clear. If you did five more reps, you did five more reps. And if your diet is off, if your training is off, if your sleep is bad, it's hard to see strength gains when those things it's are It's a great off. metric, yeah, because you can just trick yourself all day with like your energy levels or you know how well you're doing in the gym, other than like strength being that one thing that consistently, if you're seeing progress uh, or you're not seeing progress, yes. that's how you need to kind of adjust and also maybe refocus what you're doing so you can get strong in a different direction than what you're, you know. It, uh, doing before that it's a great metric but it's still flawed too of course nothing's no single metric if right? you take if you take a complete newbie who has not strength trained either ever or in a very long time and you throw the worst training program at them okay just like terrible programming overtraining, bad exercises poor rest they can get stronger because mm -hmm. it's it's so novel to the body that you'll see it now it'll It'll come it ain't to gonna last very yeah. Long. It'll come to a halt real quick. But the initial couple weeks, when you're first getting, or maybe even a month or two of training for a newbie, I think sometimes that can be deceiving. Yeah. I mean, I, how many times have you seen that? Where you you know the person's not following a, a good regimen, but they're seeing 
strength gains. And so therefore they think like it's really working. Yeah. It, it won't last forever. And you're right. No, no single metric is perfect. It's just one of the better single metrics, I would say that you can measure. But, you know, I, I could say, I guess, loosely and generally speaking, probably for the first, I don't know, two or three years of your consistent training routine, uh, you know, program or career or whatever, the first two or three years, if you see relatively consistent strength gains, which you can do in the first three years, after that, it gets really hard. Things start to plateau. Obviously, I'd, I'd be benching a thousand pounds by now if I could continue to get stronger. But within the first three years, if you see these relatively consistent strength gains where you look at your chart and you see month over month some increases in either repetitions or strength, because it's not always linear, you're probably on the right track. Because if you're underfeeding or you know not eating right or you're overtraining, undertraining, it's going to be hard to see that. But yeah, you're right. In the very beginning, almost anything you do, you're yeah. going to see strength gains. But it won't last very long. Well, and I think too, to, to be able to see other directions like so if i'm looking at increasing my range of motion but getting strong in that range of motion Good it's point. a different pursuit than just seeing me load more weight and so there's other ways of evaluating strength uh, other than just, you know, that I'm progressively overloading consistently. Yeah, good yeah. point. Like, can I do, am I doing a, a larger range of motion with good control with the same weight as before? That means I'm stronger. Do I feel more stable and solid? Right. That means I'm stronger. Yeah, mobility is strength driven. So that's yes. the other thing I think is is confusing. Like it's the, just attribute that to flexibility, but really what you're doing is getting yeah. strong and supported around your joints. T talking about mobility and joints, you guys have me thinking about this uh, this weekend. So I got with my buddies that uh, we go back like 30, 30 years, right? And they the the two of them both have kids. They had kids before me, right? So we have. Uh, Justin with a four-year-old and then uh, Jared with a three and then I have the, the two and a half year old. Mm. So it's always neat when we get together because I can kind of, they're always a little bit ahead of me. So hearing like what's going on. So, and I had this moment where I kind of pulled myself out of like the conversation about, oh my God, how much has this conversation like changed, right? When we used to get together, it was all sports and talking shit and stuff like that. Now it's like dad hacks. It's like, with the, <laughs> like how did you figure yeah. to get your son down so, so quick, right? So- yeah. <laughs> we were sharing Justin. Justin has the oldest, right? And he's like, "Oh, bro." He's like, "Right, right now, my my wife has the 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 newborn, so she's taking him, and then I have our, her, and then I have my son." And he goes, "She doesn't know this right now, but nights have gotten pretty easy because now he has this like, out of randomly, I'll go upstairs to do our little routine where we read, and he'll say, "Daddy, I'm tired. I just want to go to bed." He's like. Okay. You know, so, so we skip, cool. the, yeah, we skip the reading and he goes right to bed. And so we start, we start talking about that. Is he laying there? So his wife, thinks yeah. Oh, totally. So she thinks that he's like really having to work to put the, like put, a yeah, put, yeah, yeah, put his son down. He'll lay in there. He was totally saying that. So we got into talking about like putting the kids to sleep and there's like this universal thing that I, I, I guarantee you guys obviously have probably gone through this cause you're ahead of me also of, um, you know, there's a phase where, you know, they're, they're kind of going down by themselves, but you still got to be there. And then you, and you wait till they kind of fall asleep and then you sneak out of the room, you know, yeah. and at least my son, like he has to feel you, you know, so I'll lay in the bed next to him. And then like every once in a while, he'll do this, you know, to make sure I'm there. And we all had this the, to the mobility and joint thing that it reminded me of is man, I, it, it's a hard night to get him down to sleep. I finally get him like I think he's out and I creep away. I slowly do the finger thing, right? So all five fingers are on his back and then it's four, then three, then two, and then one, <laughs> oh, right? God. And then you Every roll, just the magician your way yeah, out. Yeah, you magician your way out, you roll off the bed all smooth and then your fucking old joints. Clack, 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 oh. Pop, dude. And then he hops up and he wakes up. Dad? You know, <laughs> fuck. You got to start it all over again. It's like every one of us have had that experience of trying to sneak out of the room after uh, uh, trying to put him down my, and waking so, him up. So you using my toes that give me away. Me, <laughs> yes. It's my, have, knee, my knees. That's what gets me. I have a, on my Damn left it. foot, my big toe, it snaps. So what I, what I figured out is I have to keep my foot bent <laughs> while I'm putting him down because if it's straight and then I bend it, it makes the pop. The loud pop. Also, and this was when yeah. this was when my son was younger. He goes down really easy now, which is really cool. Thank God, because before we have this other baby, it's like I can't deal with two. So he's going down really easy. But before when it was tough, Jessica literally mapped out the room and yeah. where you step so that the floor doesn't creak. Oh yeah. So the she's like floorboard. Yeah. So she's like, you got to walk over here and walk <laughs> around the edge and then you come over here. Otherwise the floor is going to, 
So it's like you're you're navigating yeah. this minefield, you know? Yeah, so it's like the, the Mission Impossible where he goes through all those lasers and he's like doing the thing. Yeah, you see dude. that part? Oh, okay. I love that. So this was like the, this was the conversation for like I, we were like in it for like forty five minutes, and I had the and we're laughing and going back and forth, and I pull myself I'm like, oh my god, how much has this changed? And then I pulled up the video. I had to. I have to share this video that Justin shared. I freaking died. Now, did Courtney? Is she the one who caught it? Yeah. So she was at home with the the boys, right? Oh, the day. I love this video. And so Everett, who is like a mini Justin, right? Yeah. So I just can't help but every time I see him, I'm just like, oh my god, he's so he's so Justin, right? Yeah. And he's a there's carbon copy. Yeah. There's a there's a video. <laughs> a cool. Courtney's in. It looks like she's in from her kitchen or dining room inside the house, and she's videoing uh, Everett out there, and he's got one of those like. You know, those little trike bike things. It's like a hoverboard, but it has like an attachment that goes over. It makes it like a, a go-kart yeah. kind of looking. And she, you could tell she 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 starts videoing it because she's watching him. And you can see oh, that so she kind of knows what's coming. Like, because he starts, he starts like spinning himself, <laughs> right? And he's, and he's going around and around. And it's, and it's the funniest thing ever because he has no idea he's being watched. And you see him after he's done and she's like kind of narrating over it like, oh, he's about to feel this, right? He's, he, he's about, and then you just see him, he's sitting there and he's just like, Oh, yes. like, oh God. He stops. He, has, he stops and he's like holding his yeah. head. And the he, mistake just yeah. like sets in. Totally did his, it to himself. And he's all sick. Yeah, watch him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and she caught it all in tape. I was yeah. dying. I was laughing because he stops and he's like, oh, oh, yeah. And I bet you he did it again after. He oh, yeah, he did it again. He's he just he's just like that. And again, it's, it's really kind of weird to watch from afar. It's like, oh, my God. This is like watching myself like go through all these like stages of childhood you know that was one of those where you just you find your limit and you just you go for it dude you know and that's the thing and uh yeah he's been cracking me up lately uh, uh ethan's been uh hanging out with his buddies and stuff all weekend so i hung out with him pretty much all weekend and took him around and stuff and uh we uh we were watching tv and so Courtney and I were watching TV. We had these memories of Baywatch as being like, oh, yeah, that was a show I used to watch as a kid, you know? And it had, like, Baywatch remasters. So we're like, yeah, let's watch this with Everett, right? And I don't know if you guys, like, remember at all. The slow-mo intro? It literally is, like, softcore porn. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The yeah. slow-mo intro. Don't it's, you remember the, that classic intro yeah. to it, though, the, the way the, the show The whole started? thing is a montage of just, like... Movies bouncing. Yeah. yeah. And, and the they're like fake working out together and the guy's shirtless. And then the other girl is like, just like pretending to pick something up. And he's like right behind her, helping her and stretch. I'm like, Oh my God, dude, dude. This, I was, it was so awkward, but I was like, also like, you know, I, like this is, uh, I'm like preparing him. PG 13 in the eighties and nineties was, is not what PG 13 is today. If yeah. you watch PG 13 from the eighties and nineties, it's it would not fly. I feel today. like it's the same stuff. The only difference is that the it was subtle back then, and we're now it's just straight yeah. in your face. Well, no, we're, no, we're, literally. If you watch PG thirteen today, it's 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 less bad. It was worse in the eighties and nineties. Uh, I've done this where I've watched movies. I'm oh PG thirteen, we can watch this. Yeah. And I'm watching. I'm like, I can't. This is not cool for my kids. Let's yeah. change real quick. I don't remember them doing this or saying this or whatever. <laughs> yeah, well, it's like they wore like the one, but dude, I mean, it's like cut like this, dude. And, and That's why it was popular. Yeah, but but then the, it was funny because there was this one episode where there was an old man and he was like pretending to have a heart attack. And it's because one of the, the this hot chick out <laughs> yeah. there was wearing this bi almost bikini, but it was just barely kind of like cut, a like a Brazilian cut or whatever. Yeah. And it wasn't even a thong. And I'm like, dude. He, his heart would have exploded in today's <laughs> in, Instagram land, you know? That's hilarious. Now, yeah, do you think part of, that, part of that is because you're a dad now? Of course. Like if you- Your perception it, changes. Yeah, I, I think course. that I think some of it is just that. Because I imagine that, you know, our parents probably thought the same thing when they saw Bro, Baywatch. Watch, they probably thought, oh my God, I can't believe watch this. Watch an right? old movie. But they watched it with us. That's the awkward thing. Because you know? <laughs> your dad wanted to watch yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, I know his motivation. Yeah. yeah. My yeah. dad my dad used to, because it was all VHS. So what he would do is he would just fast forward it. So I would see the sex scene. <laughs> it would just be fast forward with the like the, the lines, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, huh? Well, 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 I think Nothing is more awkward than watching a, a movie as a young teenage boy with your parents in a sex scene. No, that is like the most way. awkward moment. Like I, I, I that is was more embarrassing or awkward for me than probably anything that happened to me at school. Ever. Yeah. Well, well, so watch, yeah. watch an old movie where there's like teenagers running amok 
and parents are like like um what's that one where the dude skips school it's real, real Ferris popular. Bueller okay watch Ferris Bueller yeah. yeah or watch the Breakfast Club now when I watched those as a kid I was Ferris Bueller I was the uh -huh. kids in detention now when I watch I'm like that kid you little shit what the hell <laughs> you're the principal now yeah now I'm the principal in, in, in the breakfast I'm like those kids are fucked I hope the principal can't you know don't mess with the bull young man you'll get the horns as I'm watching I'm like I can't believe these kids yeah so it totally changes you get angry yeah and the other thing too that changes is uh, 10 o'clock is something different than it used to be 10 p.m. 10 p.m. used to be like it's only 10 let's go out now, this happened last night. I'm watching TV with Jessica. And I'm like, oh, I'm kind of tired. And I looked at the clock. I'm like, 10, 15. Oh, my Turn God. Turn it off. I'm going to go to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to no. be able to wake up tomorrow. <laughs> Tomorrow's ruined. You know what I mean? Hey, how was your uh, how was your trip down to see Tom? Oh, it was great, man. I had a good time down in LA. I went down there to, uh, I was on his podcast, his show. You got to go in the big uh, bajillion dollar mansion, yeah? Gorgeous house. I didn't see much of it, but I did see where he has like the studio set up. It's I think it's the house. I'm pretty sure it's the house that was on the first episode of Selling Sunset. The pilot episode, the one where they're on the deck. My son's favorite show. And yeah, I bet it yeah. is. Is, is it really? That's why I tell Katrina. <laughs> why are we watching this again? Oh, yeah, Max likes it. Max, Max, is in, Max is into it. You know, he's learning about real estate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's hilarious. No, it looked, it, it looked I mean, from, from what I saw, it looked uh, absolutely gorgeous. And you guys know Tom. He's such a nice, you know, just gracious person. So we had a good conversation. So it was a good time. Good staff. I got to meet his team over there. Then I went down and met with the with the team over at Regenerative, who we work with at MP Hormones. Great culture. You know, when you walk into it, you guys know this with gyms, you can walk into a gym and in five minutes, you know, this is a successful club and this one is not a successful, by the vibe and the yeah, culture. Totally. They have a great culture in there. As soon as you walk in and you can see people are friendly, they're talking, everybody's having a good time, everybody's working hard. Everybody looks, you know, like they, they're fit and they take care of themselves and just great energy. Yeah. It's great. They've great been place. growing a lot, huh? Like hiring people. And Dude, I didn't know this. The so man. they actually do, they do at their clinic in LA, they do stem cell um, therapy too. Oh, cool. Yeah. So they do that as well. Oh, very so, cool. So yeah. And they have other stuff that they do, which is That's so cool. nice. Yeah. Because before it was like your only option was to go to like Panama and it was like illegal, you know, to get like stem cell. Yeah. Uh, treatments. The so. stem cell stuff it's, is really it's starting to really kind of uh, make its way. I don't. I don't follow it that much, so I'm not even familiar with like what what is it best for. Like I imagine that because there's a lot of things that they've used it for, right? Yeah. So and are there certain? Do you know if there's like certain things like man, stem cell is like life changing for this and this. It works sometimes for this. Like so, I am what does not. That look like I'm not super privy to it. I just from the conversations I had with the with the people who are over at. Um, you know, down at Regenerative, I did a little bit of reading afterwards. So I, I do know that stem cells are essentially cells that can be turned into any cell, right? So it's the beginning of a cell. Your body can use that cell to make more cartilage, to regenerate or help a an organ or inflammation or whatever. Apparently, now I know some of the treatments are direct. So like you, you inject directly into a knee, if you want to recover faster or whatever. But I guess you can also put it in your bloodstream and it goes to where your body needs it. So they were telling me about someone who had COPD, which is a condition of the lungs, through the stem cell treatment, totally reversed it. Which, I mean, this is an anecdote, so it's one person, but it's crazy. I want to do some more reading on it. I remember um, when we interviewed, uh, what's his name, over in, in uh, Florida, Okay, his name slipped my mind. Uh, Lane? Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins. Oh, thanks, Tony. Tony. <laughs> he talked about the like how much of a difference oh, it made yeah, yeah. for him and other people. So I'm really interested. I want to look. I want to start reading more about. It. And I know people swear about it. You know, I know people who've done it themselves and have said it's like it fixed my back or my shoulder or whatever. Yeah, it's I really just don't, interesting. I just don't know how, uh, like, what the the percentage of success is. Like, I, I've no heard idea. people talking about it. I know it's really expensive. Um, but I didn't know like, okay, is this like a 50, 50 shot or is it guaranteed? It's going to make me at least feel better. Maybe it even heals this area. Mm -hmm. Like I, I haven't done enough, uh, diving into it to really, to really fully understand. Yeah. It's crazy. I'll tell you what though, going through, cause I had to go from airport to obviously where I was staying to Tom's. Oh, to no mask now, right? No, no. So, well, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that too. So no mask at the airport. Now some people still do it, still do it. I would say it's probably. It's a fashion statement now. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> I would say probably yeah. uh, maybe 15 to 20 percent, maybe, maybe a little less, maybe 15 percent. That, mu that still much work. still. Well, I was in, I mean, in, I mean, in California still. So I'm, I'm assuming different states are going to have different, of course. Uh, you know, percentages of people. 
Um, and I do, do you understand think that's always going to be the case. I have a feeling it will. At yeah. least like, you know, like 5% or 2% of people. Yeah. I feel like if you've committed this far, you may as well go all in and stay with it then. Yeah. That's how I feel. You know, feel the, like if you're if you're in on it that far, I know what there's potential risks of not wearing one, although the data shows, real world data shows that it didn't do anything, probably because people don't use proper medical protocol and use the exact right mask and good luck trying to get lots of people or kids to do that. Because yeah. we never consider that when we pass legislation. We always just say, this looks good, sounds good. Yeah. We don't. Uh, equate human behavior. But nonetheless, I tell you, man, seeing people's faces is important for your health. It really is. It's the one part of the, so much of your brain is dedicated to re reading facial expressions and reading people's faces more than any other part of their body. And what we do is we cover each other up and then you're in public and you don't, in my opinion is you don't get the same value that you would get from being around people because you don't see faces you just see bodies it's a weird thing it's i've always said this even before any of this happened was just i i never trusted somebody with, with a mask on right. it's just one of those things you just like it you think there's an ulterior motive you you think they're up to some mischief like there's just that sort of conditioning has already been there with me my whole life so it's like to get me to um totally conformed to, to seeing people differently was tough. Well, you well, can't read people near you well. Have you, guys ever, you guys, have you guys ever had a friend who just like socially does not read cues, like does not pick up on like people at all, like social cues. You're like, oh my God, how does he not feel yeah, that? Or like the vibe. Yeah. So, I mean, you've had, you've obviously, socially right? Awkward. You guys have met people like this, yes. right? Yeah. So I wonder if like this time period is going to create a, a percentage more of people that are like that, right? You've all had like, and that person's kind of an anomaly. Most people, like if someone gives you like this weird look, you kind of get it. Like yeah. if I'm talking to somebody, it doesn't take very long for me to pick up if they're interested in hearing what I have to say or not. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Or and if then, what you said was taken the wrong way or the right, right way. Right. Or like, we're we're going to go through a preteen kind of phase. But there's thing. everybody you know, has that friend awkward. or person they know that just does not pick up on social cues. So I'm wondering if these like this past two years is going to have created a, a, a much bigger percentage of those people than we've ever well, seen before. I'll tell you what. Yeah. So if you travel to different countries and you stay in another country for a month or longer, cause I've done this before as a kid, we went, we would go visit family in Italy. We'd stay for the whole summer and there's cultural differences in cues and facial expressions that when I would go to Italy for two months, I would start to adapt to the cues there and I'd come back and there would be a period of adapting back over here. And I know, Doug, you went to Japan. Was it similar for you where you were reading cues and body, you know, Yeah, expression? absolutely. Right. So, so what we did essentially is we blocked a big part of that for a long time. I'm pretty sure there's gonna be a period of relearning kind of some of that stuff. It's gonna be awkward for a lot of people for a little while. So yeah. it's, and I did, I dude, I saw people that were not just masked, they were masked, visor, goggles, gloves, like full on everything. And I'm like, man, that. That sucks to be that. It does suck. To feel yeah. that afraid, I, mean, I guess. Or, it's a thing. It's like that fear is still there uh, for a lot of people. Yeah. So, so. but and then the other thing is too, I was, what I was going to say is driving through LA because I had to go from place to place and there were kind of a distance. Man, I went through some homeless encampments that were oh massive yeah, LA in is LA. Bad. Huge. Like driving through, I'm like, wow, this is crazy. I didn't realize it was. What's the number up to, Doug? Do you know what the number is down in LA, homeless? It's crazy, right? It's like 70,000, I think. It's a it's a big number. It's a huge. I think it's like. Uh, I mean, they have areas in LA that are like dedicated just to like homeless. Yeah, like, like huge encampments. Oh, yeah, that's why. That's why I drove through some that were just. I couldn't believe how big some of these encampments were. Really What's the crazy. estimated number, Doug? I see numbers here for uh, twenty twenty, which is sixty six thousand. Yeah, uh, right, seven, but let me yeah. see here. For that's a city. Yeah, I know. That crazy. is. A, it's a mental health um, and just public health. Uh, crisis that definitely needs. To Have you ever seen the addressed. stats on what percentage of that is that is what mental health? Yeah. When we talked to Dr. Drew, yeah, who, he, he now this us? is kind of something that he, that he's really working on. He said uh, North of 85% because there are people who are, who are temporarily homeless they typically don't have, they have problems, like something happened, challenges, they're temporarily it's homeless. Back trauma in. or something. People who like live on the streets, he said, oh, 85, 90% of them have wow. severe mental illness. That you got to deal with, and That's really uh, sad. and they're all, and you know addicted to drugs. So it's a, it's like you can't you have to treat those people, otherwise you're not going to get get it fixed. You know? Yeah, really crazy. Have you guys seen? Now you've probably seen all the memes with Johnny Depp and everything kind of floating around. Uh, he was in court. This, he was in court this past week. Yeah, right? so I, I haven't paid attention. All I know is is that the girl, the Amber Heard, 
Amber Heard poop on the bed or something. To, and there okay. was something. Yeah, right. what, what, yes. What, what, you just jump right into. Uh, it. Okay. <laughs> this yeah, is uh, his girlfriend, wife. Who is she? his wife? wife and, okay. Uh, so they've had back and forth, I guess. Like, so it's a defamation case. So like, she basically had. Is that, is that you, that defamation, defamation or defecation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I've always wanted to shit on right somebody's bed, you know? Okay. So <laughs> I said it right. Like the, that's like the ultimate fuck you. Turned it into a poop. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's, the, shit it's the ultimate fuck you. Yeah. Gosh. So I guess like she wrote something in some piece, like some article, um, you know, talking about abuse and this and that. They, back and forth, they've both been kind of, um, no, she's lying or he's lying or whatever. And so this is another case about a specific article that she wrote, I guess. Okay. And my point of bringing this up was really just that we're getting inundated with this and live coverage, all this kind of stuff. And, and meanwhile, we got none of this from uh, Ghislaine Maxwell and that whole like trial. We were like, Isn't that funny? like completely removed from all those details, all the people involved, all, because it's like such powerful people involved with that case. But now, oh, here's the star that you guys know, and here's his wife who revenge pooped on his bed, uh, and then it just turns into like this whole media coverage around that. Yeah, you know what I? So is I, that, is, isn't that like a dude thing to do? Is that not a what? Yeah, I, just, I mean, is that sexist for me to say that like dudes shit on beds, girls don't really? I mean, shit on I don't beds? know anybody that's ever done this. I, I, what do you mean? But doesn't that feel like that's like a guy move to do that? Don't you feel like that? I, like you, a prank, maybe? But yeah. Like, yeah. Well, that's what I mean. That, even just in like. Okay, what group of girls do you know that sit around like, you know what we should do? We should shit on that motherfucker's Dude, bed. Yeah. Let's like like she got angry bed. and she had like, one chambered, that? like ready to go. And then she just like it's a whole just it's a whole it. process. Like Yeah, yeah. you're right, Adam, because it's very much so usually like, usually they don't even admit to pooping, let alone yeah. claiming that well, that one's mine. Right. That is kind of a guy thing. I, I yeah. feel okay. I yeah. thought yeah. I'm so pretty, I guess the security guard or whatever like took a picture of it and sent it to him. Like he was somewhere like Coachella or something. <laughs> and, 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 like gets this like she just shit like right on his That's side right. That bed. is not your yeah. cat that got on the yeah. bed, buddy. What, yeah. Yeah. what are the top three red flags uh, from a <laughs> from a woman you should leave? <laughs> yeah. Number one. She takes a crap on yeah. your bed. Yeah. You know? And she admitted to it. I thought that was interesting. Now, I, I, I did read some speculation on the Maxwell case, and they said that one of the reasons why they didn't televise a lot and air a lot, and we're not hearing well, a lot like about it. Like it was too graphic for the public to No, <laughs> that that they're, it's it's leading to other investigations, and what yeah, they don't want sure. to do is blow the cases. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. With all the cameras yeah. that went off and people committing I'm sure, suicide. I'm sure themselves. these powerful people are going to be in jail. Yeah. Yeah. They'll be saying that for the next eight years until everyone just <laughs> yeah, forgets right. about it. Right? It's going to happen. Dude. It makes me so mad. I, who's in jail right now with all that? Who's in jail? Who's alive? Who's not still? like? I, She's I in jail. No, She's yeah in jail. I, I'm trying to think of any powerful. Obviously, there's no real news about anybody going down that like were part of the flight logs and all that kind of stuff. Like They just... You know, there's been some press around who actually like had interactions there, but there's there hasn't been any arrests. Dude, how crazy is it that because Epstein was so connected with celebrities and wealthy and powerful people? It's like the Kevin Bacon rule. Yeah, it's well, like every every celebrity is like six deg degrees. Six, six of, degrees well, from how many from of Epstein? Think about it this way: how many celebrities are like so afraid that a, just because they were at a party with them and took a picture? Sure, like please sure. God, don't post it. Just because you stood next to him now. Someone could post the picture and be like, here you are with, it's like, you know, with yeah. Hitler. Ah, yeah. you know, oops. Yeah. I know. Right. Crazy. Yeah. Hey, so, um, Elon succeeded. It looks like, looks wow. Like wow. I mean, you, I mean, you said it before, right? That they cut, he, he forced their hand. He kind of had, by making an offer like that, like it, th that's their duty is to do what's best for their shareholders. And if he's offering more than what the stock is trading at right now, it's, you, I mean, they kind of have to, right? Or else they can get sued for that, well, right? They so, tried. Well, yeah, what was the move? So after they rejected the offer, then he went and he rallied some more investor he groups got, and he, people. Yeah, he it? got some backing yeah. and he, you know, with Proved his offer, that he could pay it. That he could pay it. Okay, so he um, showed his, yeah. Ability. But there's they other, went around shopping other people. But there's people. other stuff that pl probably played a role. You guys know that Governor DeSantis threatened to take Twitter to court for not. Uh, for not, you know, upholding their fiduciary duties and potentially harming Florida pensioners, right? Because what they did, they did what's called a poison pill where they, yeah. they lower the price of the share by diluting it, making it harder to buy. And what DeSantis said is, we're going to sue you because you hurt all these people who invested in your company and their pensions. So what some people are speculating is the pressure of that potential hmm. lawsuit made them go, we better sell or we're going to be kind of screwed here. 
Now, my personal opinion is I don't like politicians using the power of the government to, you know, mess with their well, enemies yeah, or whatever. That's, that's a fine line. Yeah. And he's, he's power. a bit authoritarian. I don't like that. He necessarily did that, but I wonder if that played a role because now Twitter's like, if we don't sell, we're going to get through this crazy lawsuit. We're mm -hmm. going to be, you know, looked at all kinds of stuff's going to be brought to well, light. What, I mean, they, 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 they could have been sued by Elon too, though. Right. If he gives them a, a fair offer, for that and it's yes, isn't the, it their duty to have to like technically I, you could go to the sec and bring up the case um but remember this is the pen this is these are pension unions in twitter excuse me in florida very powerful voting blocks and also when your enemy is elon it looks different than when your enemy is a bunch of pensioners in florida Ooh, that doesn't look man. good right so that's the speculation that that played a role Dude. DeSantis making some crazy moves, man. He's going after Disney. He's going. I don't like that. Yeah, I don't. I don't like uh, how he's being authoritarian with his like. He's you definitely. Know. I mean, yeah. don't you feel like you kind of have to though to fight fire with fire? No, I mean, because you've said this that is, before in our own podcast. No, that's why before. we're here, dude. That's oh. why we're in this position. Is, is is people are cool when their side does it, and that raises the bar, and then the next other side does it, and then they raise the bar, and now we're at we're at now where it's like everybody's acting. Somebody has to be like, look, right? It's all the extremes. There's let's, no like. Uh, let's stop raising the bar moderate. with what we do here. Um, I know, but who's who's going to do a move big enough to Disney that can actually impact change in the opposite direction? If you, if we all agree that Disney was going way, way this one direction, which I think that is the the feeling. The market, of a respond. lot of people. The market yeah. will tell them, and the market started to tell them. That's it. That's it. Yeah, they're, it's the consumers. Yeah, they, their tax status in the status they had in Florida was since 1967, and oh, come on, DeSantis totally reversed that. As to to use his sure political power, yeah, yeah, no, that was definitely. Back. They also, I mean, they they had campaigned to uh, basically <laughs> sure you know go against his his bill. Look, like, it's all that was it's all, all like it, a misrepresentation. It's of the all bill. technically legal, but what I don't like is you know you have governors or politicians saying, "Eh, this company's pissing me off. Let's find a way to to look at their tax status or their." You know how how they're they're right. situated in the government. Let's make it harder for them and apply that. So, kind do of you think now though that uh, big businesses will kind of like back off a little bit of the throttle of the political? I don't know realm. I not, think it really depends. It, I really not, think it depends on who's running the show. Not because of them though. I yeah, think the no, market think so. is showing them right now what time it is. I yeah. mean, CNN Plus. Oh, three hundred million dollars streaming service. That's how much they invested, and they expected millions of subscribers in the first two months. They got ten thousand subscribers. <laughs> Yeah. Shut down, right? Netflix tanking, like uh, Disney's getting hit really yeah. hard. I think the I think now, the where is Netflix? Though? Can you Dude, pull their ticker up? They were they were bombing last away. week. Yeah, they were tanking pretty bad, which sucks. I you, yeah, part. but you. I mean, I don't think that that's. I don't think that's just because of the whole them getting so woke. I don't think that's why it's they're tanking. I think there's other there's other factors at play here, especially with the streaming service. I think other streaming services have gotten so good. And I also think you're that right. people are paying six to seven dollars a gallon of gas right now and you're going I mean HBO I know group, I know if I was I know if I was in that position, okay, where where the diff the difference in my gas prices really started to impact me, that one of the areas I would right away look to clean streaming. up is streaming. Because yep. I I have damn near everything and I know I don't use everything. And so if I was trying to save thirty bucks, fifty bucks here and there, I would actually my buddy just did that. In yeah. fact, one of our conversations we had this weekend was he's cut out a lot of these streaming services that he says, you know what, I just I evaluated which ones I really use. And I just, I, I got rid of all of them, but that one. And he goes, and then if I have a show on HBO or Showtime that I really want, I'll wait till the season and then I'll get it for a short window. Yep. And what's so great is that you can, you can cancel and, and then subscribe again so easily. Yeah. I think that played a role, but you can see that Netflix got hit hard. HBO grew. Disney got hit hard. Uh, Amazon prime, I think got hit a little bit, yeah. but you know what I predict is I predict that these some of these streaming services are going to come out with a free option. I bet you mm. Netflix is going to come out and say, "Here's our free commercial." Kind of like Spotify's model. Yes. So now you can you can watch Netflix for free, but you get commercials. Yeah. I bet so you that's what they're going to do. Money. Yes. Yeah, and that's just the way the market's moving. Anyway. Well, they're already talking about well, that. I read a Netflix article I think last week and, and brought really? it on the show. And one of the oh, things, that, yeah, no, they were Netflix. already talking about how much revenue. They they potentially could gain by selling selling ads on there. So there's potential that Netflix was going to go that direction anywhere with the ads. They either have that or the really cracking down on people. So there's there's a you know I think a few well, I think it was like a hundred million dollars worth of revenues that they could pick up by doing the ads and then by 
uh, cracking down on people that are sharing passwords. Mm. <laughs> so those are like their two, Nobody one of their two big that. plays to try and get them out of the out of the hole yeah. that they're in right now. So, so with Elon buying Twitter now, yeah. what do you guys think is going to happen with Twitter? Well, I like love Tesla. what you should talk about. Like some of the tweets, people are oh, just <laughs> they're just trying to test the waters right now, right? Oh, yeah. Like. Um, oh, I was on there right now, and then and there's people like people are tweeting like I like ivermectin, and yeah. then someone else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah, yeah, only yeah, uh, only women can have oh. babies. Or, now, how does yeah. saying things so, that are contrary? That how would, does that know, work? Because those, those are policies that have been passed by the board that are now embedded in Twitter. Obviously, Elon has the power to reverse it, but since he's just the changing of powers happening right now, and there's pe yeah. people being funny and doing stuff like that. I mean, technically, they could easily be removed still because it's still under. The old policies, I right? guess. I think until they change that, I don't know. I have no idea. Because not like Jack Dorsey is yeah. sitting up there at the top. Going, Speaking what? of which, Dorsey came out with a statement and said that Elon buying Twitter. I mean, mm -hmm. read his exact quote. He essentially is like, "This is a good thing." Of course it is. You're now, talking about one of the most brilliant men and entrepreneurs we've ever yes, seen. Yes, but Dorsey. Okay, so what did he say? He said, uh, "This is the right path." So a lot of people don't know this, but Dorsey and a lot of these original tech kind of moguls or whatever, but Dorsey was very much a free, a free speech guy. Of yeah. course. There, and when he left, there was speculation that he didn't like the fact that it got, you know, that people were taking, yeah, they're taking getting off. Yeah, all this pressure and, to, to I remove believe, people. He wasn't I, happy with the board. I believe I all these guys are like that. Even mm. weird old Zuckerberg or something. I think they all- <laughs> Weird old Zuckerberg. Yeah, he is fucking weird. He's, an alien, He's dude, so dude, weird. But I mean, me otherwise. I, most of the, their model is built on that, is, you know, giving people yeah. free access and yeah. free speech. And, and they didn't come out with trying to monitor. I think that's the, the pressure of the shareholders and the employees and stuff. It's this generation coming up right now that is extreme on that on that woke side, and I think they're they're getting influenced, and they're yeah. getting influenced by employees and by shareholders, I, and so unfortunately, and what sucks for them, where where I actually, and I know everybody likes to hate on billionaires, but where I have some empathy for them is I don't think it's what they want. I think I think they feel like their hand is being forced, probably. So I'm sure Dorsey's like, "Fuck yeah, give yeah. me my payout." Let me, let me I would, cash I, out and, and I wonder if Dorsey watches from yeah, the sidelines now. When it was yeah, all, I yeah. wonder if he played a role volatile in, in Elon. Taking over too. Well, so I heard that. I heard that um, he, even though he only had, what, 2% ownership yeah. or whatever, he still had a lot of influence on the board on whether they would do that. And so the, the rumor I heard was that he was very pro Elon. Well, so, so, so Twitter, interesting, right? I feel like what's going to happen is if, they, if they're able to crack down on the bots yeah. and they start, they start oh. giving authentication easier to people who can you can prove who they are yeah didn't he have some plans about uh making the the badge the, the uh, yes. available team by if you pay for it so basically authenticate right you, you show your ID you show you're a real person uh so that way there's no question or dispute that you're a bot yes so doing all that i bet at first you're going to see a drop in a, a large drop in chunk in users mm -hmm. and whatever he's going to clean things up i've also seen people speculate that twitter is a bloated company with way more employees that are necessary. So I'm wondering if mm -hmm. he's going to cut out a lot of the Yeah, you know, I, saw the fat. That's, I saw that. Well, they're stuff. already like leaving. A lot of them are leaving anyway. That's right? what I think I they mean, say. That's what the, we'll the see. Internet says. But I mean, this could be the beginning because this would make, if he follows through with his promise of open source algorithm, getting rid of the bots, authenticating people, the, my opinion will be that this will be the cleanest, most real, uh, fair social media platform. That's where I get excited is just eliminating all these bots, uh, you know, from how, like how many times have you seen arguments and you're like, are these even real people? Or is this just like a, a factory somewhere of troll, of uh, troll factory where people are just yeah. like, like literally influencing Dude, people well, that's to, the, to get in arguments. The brilliance of selling the verification badge is, is so smart because not only are you going to make a bunch of money because everybody's going to do it wherever you, you, as long as you price it somewhere fair. But now if you don't have that badge, you don't take that person seriously. Yep. They're, they haven't been verified as a real human. Therefore, you will assume they're a bot. Yep. So it really will force a lot of these people in that direction. Like, hey, if I'm going to be active or build a business on Twitter or whatever like that, I'm going to spend the 200 500 even $1,000, whatever he's going to make that. That's going to drive revenue through the roof. And it'll automatically, it'll take any sort of power that these random people have that are that are on there because they won't get verified because yeah, they're not no real. no conspiracy to this at all. It's, it's fact that there's been... A 
you know, outside influences from other countries that have created these like anonymous characters on there to just start shit. It yeah. will disrupt the, uh, you know, the good old boys club, the people that have got the badge that, you know, yeah. are, are famous and a lot of pull and stuff like that. Cause then they're not that big of a deal anymore. Yeah. You're just well, another they, person who's, I who's read that they estimate verified. up to 10% of Twitter users are not real or bots or these trolls. I saw that too. Big, I would have guessed dude. more, to be honest yeah. with you. I mean, they're all like that. Instagram is that way. Facebook is that way. Twitter. And I would have thought that Twitter and Instagram are their worst. Maybe yeah. Instagram's even more. Well, it has never like behooved them to remove it because yeah. they, of course, it's all it about sense. numbers. Now, yeah. I do want to say this because you know, I, it. I got I got yeah. booted off of uh, Instagram. And I, For I, your I, new I, photos? And I, yeah, I shared yeah. that photo. Did you see that photo? <laughs> I shared it him that, yeah. he, that went viral. Well, you can't really download it's a, it's a big file, so you got to be careful. It's small and blurry. Take I don't drop, know. Drop, yeah. drop, drop. Anyway, yeah. I, I got kicked off to, uh, Instagram, and I felt it was unfair. I don't. I didn't do anything, whatever. And I could tell that they were after me because I started getting notifications on things I posted in my story a year or two ago, even though they disappeared, which is really weird. So they're not. They only run for twenty four. So I knew something was up. Eventually, I get kicked off. I felt like it wasn't fair. People were like, do you think we should regulate? These companies, you think the government should regulate them? No. no, 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 no. Because I know how markets work and eventually you'll see competition. And what I don't want are bureaucrats having the power to use these very powerful tools and they can manipulate them and then you're screwed. Then you can't compete because they'll make laws yeah. against that. And so I'm glad, I'm you know, stick to my guns and here we are. Elon buys Twitter. It feels like now there's some other competition, yeah. you know, and there's, it's so interesting. I mean, I don't think it's that hard for someone to get booted. I think that all it takes is enough people to band together and report you enough times. I mean, I think it was the sixth time that I reported you by the time you finally got <laughs> pulled off there. <laughs> pulled off there. So it worked. takes a few times. You can't just report you Everyone once. This is like post a flexing picture. <laughs> yeah. so, he's like, no, really, on? though. I mean, I, I know there's people that think that, like, you know, there's Jack Dorsey or some, you know, blue haired kid sitting there going, like, oh my God, I can't believe he said that. Cancel him. Get him off. It doesn't work like that. You know what it's I think? It's too big. It's like enough of these people get. 20, 30 people to all report you 10, 15 that's, times. That's one way to do it. I also think the algorithm that they'll create, which we don't know what that says, can target other specific types of conversations or types of people. Or this is my belief. I got shadow banned once on Instagram. After that, I was targeted. I feel like once they put you on a list, you're under a different set of rules. And now they're very sensitive. Well, that's, I, so I think there, there is a that's my automated opinion. list like that. And the way the automated list, and of course, we're speculating right now, right? I yeah, think that- I have no idea. You, you got enough people, you ruffled enough <laughs> feathers that enough board. people reported it. That puts you in the shadow ban category. Why can't now, we just have clear clarity, some transparency? Well, that's the cool you thing know, that like, Elon is going to yeah, say, right? Yeah. I mean, that, or what he's saying he's going to do is at least like give you some clarity on how the algorithm works, which to yeah. me, that would be, uh, be amazing. Yeah. Huge. Oh, that would be just incredible. To know that that's for all, all the, yeah, it's all we want. Yeah, I don't want a mysterious editor telling you know like then if then it feels unfair. Like what's going on? And okay, I got kicked off because I said this comment. You got this mullah from Iran on there that literally you know executes people just for being gay, and he's on there you know doing his stuff. How the hell is this fair? You oh. know what I'm saying? So if it's open source, then we can be like, well, it's clear. Here's the deal. Here's where you crossed. And you're done. And I think yeah. that makes it, you know, the best option. But again, well, it's an open it's market. It's definitely getting interesting. Yeah. But I love yeah. all the people who were like, it's a private company. They can do what they want. Now that Elon, you know, buys it. We need more government yeah. regulations. Yeah. Shut yeah. your yeah. mouth. Shut it down. Yeah. Shut up. Anyway. Yeah. So how are you guys? So we did, uh, I want a little, I, I guess, uh, kind of follow up or review here. We all did those, the hair tests with Dr. Cabral. Yeah. This is where they, so people don't know, um, Doctor. we work with Dr. Cabral and he, he took samples of our hair tested us for minerals, electrolytes, and toxic metals, uh, or heavy metals, I should say. All of us were a little different. We all had a little bit of mercury, which is kind of weird, so we think it might be something here uh, in the studio. Yeah. But nonetheless, he put us on a supplement regime in order to detoxify from the heavy metal. And also, I needed more copper. I know you needed some magnesium or zinc. And yeah, yeah. So we're all in a little different regime. I need some I, copper. Do you guys, are you guys feeling any different yet, or is it too soon? So I think it's too soon to notice that. One of the things I, I realize about myself, um, I'm really bad with consistently taking that many pills. Yeah. So I order on Amazon. I've got the whole... 
I know I have to give you your supplements half the time. I'm just it's true. We'll get you I, on those little trades. Are you like good at Monday, it? I'm, I did. Tuesday, no, I got. Wednesday. I actually bought it for the oh, entire did? month. I have it with me, so I have it in the car. I'll show you guys the one I got because it even splits up. Uh, so it's a it's a seven day pill box. It's like it's, AM PM. It does it has the AM oh, wow. PM in there, and I bought four the, of them. Hey, so. hey, those containers are not big enough for the amount of shit that I. Well, take. So <laughs> that's why I mean you, and even though like what just the stack that I'm taking, I'm just I'm really not. I'm not good at that. I've never been. I've never been a big supplement taker. It's a routine. It, it's a routine. Ha, you like anything. so have to I get it in that. And what sucks is like a multivitamin. Some of these pills that I'm taking, like I have to do it with food. And so there's a lot of mornings where I don't eat something right away. Yeah. I don't eat until my first meal till after we've podcast in the morning sometimes. And so I'm I'm behind on that. I'm not. So I've I've got everything now. So I I bought all the stuff. I stacked it out. I mean, it's a very detailed regimen like he they give you not only do we get this great consultation where they break down everything that's going on with me where i'm deficient what we what we need to supplement with but then he even gives you this printout of you know every single day morning night they do a really cool way of like color coordinated these are all liquids this is all yeah. pills this is optional this is like must like so i mean it's i i love i will say this is the only way in my opinion this is the only way to really take nutrients properly. And what I mean by that is you could take a general multivitamin or you could guess what to take, but you don't really know unless you're tested. And then mm -hmm. like, I would have not guessed that I needed that my zinc to copper ratio was a lot. I don't well, oh, I know. supplement with yeah. copper. Well, oh, none, I, I don't think any that. of us would have guessed, but what I thought was interesting was when he was reviewing it with us, how like he doesn't know us personally. Right. Right? I mean, we have a, like a small relationship with him, not enough to know our habits and our eating and stuff. Like but like, I felt like we all could have guessed the report who it went to based off of where they were deficient yeah. or the things he talked about. So I thought that was really, really yeah, interesting. Spot on with everybody to do the whole supplement stack and be consistent with all of it. It's not cheap at all, but I mean, it's it's going to be customized yeah. to that person. Yeah, and so I think that's where. Obviously, they make up for it over the course yeah, of time. I'm, I'm on the zinc people. copper supplement with the right ratio. I have, um, I'm doing the chlor broken cell chlorella and cilantro. That's mm -hmm. to help with the the mercury. Uh -huh. I'm also doing sauna or steam or both uh, five days a week, which helps. So well. in my re my breakdown, it actually says to do the cleanse separate of my other stack. So I'm yes. actually not running the cleanse right now. So I, I don't, and I didn't get clarity. And I, if you take them together, I think they'll they'll prevent the absorption of some nutrients. Right, so I'm not right now. So I have everything. I have all the supplements to do the mercury cleanse, but I'm actually just doing the other stuff first. So he's separating it by time, not even in the day. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so there, yeah, you have to, so I mean, I don't know if, if yours is sim like similar in that area or not, but it, it, in mine, it says to not take the, the cleanse thing while also taking my other stack. So uh, right now I'm doing the, I'm, for me, Obviously, I want to get all my levels balanced, but I mean, the hope for me is that this helps my psoriasis more than anything else mm -hmm. because it's an autoimmune issue. And if I can get all this balanced out, I'm hoping that I'm going to see that. And I, it's too early to tell anything right now, but I definitely, uh, I know I've been complaining to you guys, like it was the worst yeah. it's been in my life, like after COVID. Um, I'm back to much better. Really? Yeah. Much, Already? I am, yeah. And I, I hate, I don't want to... You know, I don't want to attribute all that to what oh, I'm doing right now. I feel like it's too early to do that. But I, I definitely am better than what I just was a month ago. Dude, so. speaking of mm. nutrients, study just came out that they gave, this was a really good study. They gave, uh, I think it was people over the age of 70, I want to say, 60 or 70, 2,000 IUs of vitamin D a day, 1,000 milligrams or gram of omega-3s every day, and two days or three days a week of basic strength training, 30 minutes, okay? So this was the regime that they put people on. Massive reduction in, in cancer. It was like it was like 30% reduction in cancer from doing those things. Wow. And it was like a 50 or 60% reduction in all cause mortality from wow. doing those three things. Vitamin D, omega-3, strength training. Now, strength training by itself or resistance training, when they were looking at the effects of there was another study I looked at where they have compared different forms of exercise on health. Strength training was the one that showed the greatest anti-cancer risk, mm -hmm. more than cardio, more than other forms of exercise. Yeah, that's really cool, fascinating. I mean, in 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 terms of supplements, those are usually the two that I tend to recommend the most because yeah. you find people are 
definitely deficient uh, for the majority of people are deficient in those nutrients. Yeah, yeah I feel like it, more so, at least in, in, in my short fitness career, I've heard vitamin D talked about more now than I did before. And yeah. I don't know if that's because of COVID and the stuff. It's because it's so low. Like You yeah. test a bunch of yeah, people. Yeah, what is it? 60, 60 something percent of all people are, are deficient? Yeah, in, the numbers I saw D. were like 40 to 60 percent. But uh, even if it was 20 percent, like it's like, a lot. Yeah, uh, that's, yeah, it's that's millions and millions, millions of people. Of people. Yeah. And, a, and being in a def, being deficient, vitamin D acts like a hormone in the body. Being deficient in vitamin D is not great. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about you're more anxious, yeah. you're more depressed, depression goes up, you have hormone issues. If you're a man, your testosterone is going to be low if your vitamin D is low. Do you know what the mechanism that it wor like it works with in order? Like, I know it's directly connected to testosterone too, right? If you have really low vitamin D levels, yep. you also tend to have low testosterone. Yep. What is it that causes it? Do you know? Do you I don't know. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, yeah. But I know the way the body synthesizes vitamin D is it uses cholesterol, which is kind of this base molecule, right? It's a steroid molecule. Mm -hmm. And when you expose your skin to the sun, it uses the, it turns cholesterol into vitamin D, if I'm not mistaken, and you get more vitamin D. And just something we've stripped out of our diet completely. Yeah. And we don't demonize for whatever in the sun anymore either. I think that's a yeah, lot of why. Sun, I yeah. think that's why we're seeing it and why it's continually to get worse. Totally. It's just because yeah. we, we're under fluorescent lights all day and yep. less and less people are outside. Like, I just think that has a lot to do with 100%, it. 100%. Yeah. All right. I want to touch on something real quick that happened this uh, over the weekend. So it's interesting because, and I want to talk about it a little bit because we kind of did this early when we started Mind Pump, but we we did this differently. Than, than the way I'm seeing a lot of people do uh, this now on social media. And this is where pages, smallish pages, 5,000 followers, 10,000 followers, one of their strategies to grow and get attention is to attack a large growing brand. And they do so to get attention so that they can grow. And it's really annoying and it's really dumb because, and now I know we used to do this as well because, you know, obviously when we first started, we were small. And our goal was to expose a lot of the myths out there. Yeah. But we were also very careful about who we who we went after. And what a lot of these other pages are doing is they take things out of context. Yeah. And it's just like, oh, you're big. And they did this to, they took some of my posts, some of these pages, put some them up. And they were so out of context. They were tweets. They and were, and like, they were so yeah. out of context. I was referring to episodes that we had done. And they're like, trying it to be funny It was such about a reach. It. They were just trying yeah. to find any angle they could to, to put you on blast. Yeah, it's stupid. And now the, the issue I have with it is, first off, it's dumb. You're not helping anybody because now you're just confusing a bunch of people. It's a cheap way to grow your brand. But here's my irritation. It's with myself because it's really hard for to me not. not to get annoyed. And you have and to. And then know. give them the attention they want. It's like they yeah. win. You know what I mean? I got to oh, learn yeah. how to shut I my just, It's a practice. Yeah. I'm going to have to keep uh, working on it because it's just going to get worse. I just hate it. Josiah yeah. just interviewed me and we actually, we went down this this path. Um, he's like a longtime listener, a uh, fan of ours from early, early days. And he was bringing up like, uh, yeah, I haven't really had a chance to be as consistent as I used to be. I still peek in on you guys, but man, it almost sounds like the mission is different today than what it was before. And he goes, so ha has the mission changed? I said, you know, it's funny. I get that from people that heard us really early on and then maybe they took a break for a few years or whatever, and then they came back and then they, they hear how we communicate and they feel like, oh, we're different now, or we're not, the mission's different, or we were. And I go, you know, it's not that. I said, I think we went through a, a point where what you're talking about, where we would, we uh, it did doctors or famous people or massive influencers. If you were promoting bad stuff, um, or if we thought you were, we were operating in a place of lack of integrity or morals or whatever, like that we would use you as an example to teach our audience. Like, mm -hmm. let's take that. And I said, there came a point. Um, where I, we started to feel like, man, we have to be careful because we're not so small anymore that it could kind of come off as bullying. Yeah. And, our, and our, even when we started it back then, uh, the, the intention was never to hurt, right? It wasn't the, the. It was to counter. Well, it was to use them as an example to help others, right? It was like we didn't go like, hey, that guy's giving bad friends. Let's crush his business. No. That wasn't how we did. We said, hey, here's a great example of somebody who has massive influence or a lot of people pay attention to, yes. or they think he's right because of his acronym after his name. Let's use them as an example so we can educate and teach our audience. But at some point, we got to the size where if we did that, it came off like we were bullying people. And so, and also, we were, uh, we were, we did due diligence to try to, re to maintain context and to be accurate. Because, you know, if I do a tweet that has a statement on it and I'm referring to an episode, or I'm obviously talking to a mind pump fan, you know what I'm talking about. But mm -hmm. out of context, be like, what do you, 
What do you mean well, overhead you, press will I'll make your you, bench press stronger or whatever, right? I'll give you an example yeah. of that. Uh, Lane was a, a great example of this. Lane has uh, some things that we disagree with. Yeah. But we also really like Lane. I can say, we. I would say we consider Lane as one of the good guys that are in the space that are yeah. promoting good information overall. Yet there are some things we we differ in opinions about. And so we would take something and debate or have a talk. We wouldn't try and, and bash or put him down, or and we or we would all say like I really like a lot of stuff he puts out. This one statement or this one point, I disagree with it, and this is why. Where you just see like, and then the people that you're referring to right now, I don't want to give them any light because they're they're nobody. Well, that's what they wanted. They're nobody really, yeah. right? But what right away where they lost credibility for me is I saw they were targeting two other big pages. One of those being Squat University, and I can't remember the other one, but both were people that I like. That I think that are whether I agree with all of their information or not. When I'm looking at it, I'm like these are these are people that I think have a very good message and are helping most people. It's like when we saw someone attack Max Lugavir, same thing. It's yeah. like you're going after the wrong people. Like if you're gonna go, if you're gonna build your business off of punking people for putting disinformation out there, then go after the people that are really harming That's or not difference. helping or manipulating people. Don't go after somebody who's promoting a really good message and then take something out of context and try and freaking just, you know, yeah. make you know yourself look smarter. Over, like, yeah. It's and, just a bad look. Well, and it, if you don't know the motivation, that's where we try to bring the awareness, you yeah. know? And it's like, we know the tricks. We know the ways that, um, you know, the focus could be a lot more on, money and, and attention and all these other factors to it that we know it's not about getting your behaviors to change in a positive direction, which is that's you, usually who we try to bring on the show or bring light to or people that uh, are concerned about that in, in really helping your average person, not confusing them with all these little nuanced details of, uh, you know, if we get in, especially in the, the, the scientific, the intellectual side of our space, it's, it's all it is, is just, we're, we're going to get in arguments about nonsense that doesn't help anybody. Just yeah, confuse we're gonna, them. It's a splitting hairs argument. Or we're yeah. going to keep pushing it. And this study shows that. Yeah, no, but it's the just thing, mental masturbation. The thing that annoys me is honestly, is that they won. Because the goal was they got to get your attention. attention. They got your attention. And to start a little thing. Yeah, and yeah. after I let myself calm down, I'm like, because here's the deal. I have a, this is a personal thing. When someone lies about me or my team and I know our intentions, I'm a pit bull. And so when I, when I, and as we get bigger, it's going to keep, it's going to happen more. And so I need to like, so I gave myself a rule. If I see something like that, I'm going to wait 24 hours. Oh, there I you still go. want to say something. There you go. Yeah. Because if I, I respond that's a, with that's an a great way to do that yeah. because I bet you 99% of the Nine, time more, probably a hundred percent. Yeah. Cause almost every time it's a waste of my time. Well, yeah. Cause it gets you emotionally riled up. And then yeah. once you let it settle down and you kind of, wait, wait, who is this? And the, all they're really like, who trying cares? Yeah, who cares? Yeah. Who cares? It's not really affecting anything. So stupid. So, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So, uh, I finally tried the green fl apple ah, flavor. What do you think? It's hella good. Fire. It's Fire. really good. It's really good. Yeah. Or they Organifi crushes the flavor stuff. They're, I mean, oh, their yeah. green juice already was, in my opinion, the best tasting on the market. Was All green juices taste like crap. Yeah. I'm going to be straight up. So some are worse or less like crap than others. I don't care. I'm a supplement like grass guy. grass shavings. I, yeah. I'll yeah, drink yeah, anything. You guys know this. I don't care about flavors, okay? But Organifi kills it. This is actually, it's actually a good, If I so I, I mixed it in ice. And I was sipping on it, and I'm like, "This is a good drink." It's yeah. bomb. They do. A really I mean, good I job. like their green juice already, but the the is it apple crisp? Is that what they call it? The apple or crisp? crisp apple. Crisp, oh, crisp apple. apple. Yeah, yeah, good, real yeah. good. It's actually really, really good. So I don't know what magic they do back there, but they do it. Yeah, they know job. what they're doing for sure. Hey, what's up, everybody? Look, there's a company that we work with because we're dads that care about the health of our children. I have an 18 month old. And when I went and looked for baby food uh, on the market, they were all terrible except for one company, Serenity Kids. This company makes nutrient-dense baby food formulas. Uh, there's no sugary fruits. It's high in quality grass-fed meats like beef and bison. They use things like bone broth. Um, it's really, really good stuff. It's the only baby food that I'll feed my son. So if you are health-conscious, and you have a child and you want them to be healthy and you have to buy something that's convenient, easy to use, go check out Serenity Kids. In fact, we got a discount for you if you want to try them out. You can get 20% off if you go to mindpumppartners.com, click on My Serenity Kids, and then use the code MP20 for that discount. All right, here comes the rest of the show. First question is from Namle 
how often should you see a chiropractor? Ooh, that's a good question. You know, I'm going to make a general statement here. Oh, uh, boy. I might yeah, piss people off. I feel like of all the health fields uh, and positions mm. that chiropractors fall very neatly into two categories. <laughs> They're either really smart, brilliant, understand correctional exercise and do a great job, or they're quacks, shucksters. Like I have not met anybody in the middle. They're either supplement peddlers here or they're here. Yeah. So okay. So well, let me I answer. feel like that's the same. It's the same. You're saying the same thing. Just some decide to, to wield their powers for good, and others decide to wield their powers yeah, for bad. Right. Totally. It's like you get the dark side because it's yeah. I what it is is it's you have all that knowledge and information. So you have the ability to communicate things about the body that most people don't. Mm -hmm. And there is, there can be tremendous value in chiropractor work. Mm -hmm. And there is also the ability to give somebody like instant relief, which that's very powerful. And so then what from there it is, you know, do you have integrity and do you, do you give these people not only the the instant relief that you know you can give them, but also the way to address the root cause yeah. it's of in the how business they got model. of how they got here, or are you in the business of just keeping appointments going for the rest of their life? Yeah. Which, if by it's the in way, the a lot business of business model, a lot see of that. a lot of clients of mine that I used to train. That was like, I remember I'd get clients and they'd be like, oh yeah, I'd be doing like their schedule and they'd be like, oh, well, that's the day I see my chiropractor. And I'm like, oh, what do you see in your chiropractor? Oh, I always see my chiropractor. It's just yeah. like- Like a tune-up. Yeah, exactly. It's like, it becomes uh, something that they just do forever. And what do they do for you? Yeah. I'll go in and get adjusted. Yeah, and they and feel least, amazing. Yeah. Okay, so then, that, so it's hard to, to, especially when I'm the new trainer who just, they just hired to be like, oh, well, maybe you're never going to need that again after I get a hold of you, yeah. but you don't want to say that because they've built a relationship and a consistency with this person. And already. I'll give a little bit of, uh, I guess, like in terms of how they they promote some of the business practices, I think that uh, sometimes it kind of ends up a certain way, right? So if, if you have uh, chiropractors that are doing well business-wise, they start structuring it in a way where they can see more appointments and more frequently, and so they start reducing the amount of time they're actually servicing these patients. That's a, so, there's a name for that. I think, is it network chiropractic? Is that what it is, Doug? Doug, you, you were in the field a little bit. It was like a term for it where there was like a business model. Was he in a field or was he one of the guys who got suckered into no, it? No, no, but he was, Doug was, he, back when I used to train Doug and when we first became friends, he helped uh, with some chiropractors in their marketing. Oh. So we kind of understood a little bit. Not and with it, marketing. I didn't help with It wasn't marketing. marketing. It was no, internet. I sold life insurance to oh, chiropractors. Oh, that's okay. My bad. Yeah. My so, bad. I mean, I know there are some groups that are very much like, let's churn these people through our system. If that's what you're referring yeah, to. Yeah, where they'll set up like five 15, people. 15 minutes. Yeah. And they do, they'll go they crack, 15, crack, 15 crack, 15 crack. 15-minute increments. Yeah. I, I think good chiropractors use correctional exercise a lot. Yeah. Bad ones just adjust. Now, adjustments have their place. And, and the people that really explained the, this the best to me are two chiropractors I have a tremendous amount of respect for. Jordan Shallow. Mm-hmm. Um, and Dr. Dr. Justin Dr. Brink. Brink. Okay. Dr. Justin Brink, in fact, helped us uh, create uh, Maps Prime Pro. So he was actually somebody that we worked with to put that together. Um, and then Jordan Shallow is just this brilliant guy. And the way that they explain the adjustments is there are parts of the body where either through poor movement patterns or tight muscles or your CNS is protecting certain areas, you can't articulate a joint. And so what happens is the muscles around, they get tight kind of seize up. And then the way you release them is like if the way I would release my hamstring. My hamstring's real tight. I stretch it, yeah. right? So they're able to articulate a joint, cause that release. Oh, the CNS now lets go of that muscle, allows the muscle to relax, and I feel pain relief. But then what you have to do is follow up yes. with correctional exercise to prevent what is causing that to happen in the first place. Otherwise, What'll end up happening is what you're saying, Adam. You got to keep going to the chiropractor every week for the same thing in my neck, the same thing in my back. My shoulder always hurts. They crack it and then it feels better. But then next week I got to go back. You right? wanted to unlock your movement potential. So if there's something restrictive yeah. and, and you, like, so sometimes like there's been accidents or there's been injuries yeah. or certain things where, you know, your, your joint just doesn't. Uh, have that range of motion anymore, and you, you need that manipulation, that subluxation, I guess they call yeah. that, to kind of pop things in alignment. So that way, now I can go through those ranges of motion. But you have to keep consistently practicing that to relearn that with you know your your muscles to respond properly. Yeah. I, I find it really ironic that our Maps Prime Pro and Prime Program are the programs that chiro some chiropractors are most critical of 
when it was something that we created with Dr. Brink. Yeah. And I think they're critical of it because it takes from their business. If I give people the answers on how to fix something themselves, if they put the work in to address like your what your point was, the root cause, they may never need a chiropractor again. And this is what I would tell clients when they would come in and say, oh, I see my chiropractor forever. And I said, well, you know, we'll see after I get a chance to assess you and we start training. But you know, there's a very good chance that I can eliminate you ever having to see them again, right? Like we can actually strengthen your imbalances and get to a place where you don't have chronic pain all the time and you don't need someone to pop you to get relief. You know what? I'm going to counter that. And the reason why I'm going to counter that is because a lot of trainers will feel that way too. If I get, and I've heard people say this, what happens if you get someone in shape, you're losing clients. They're not going to come back. The better I got as a trainer, the longer people stayed with me. Mm. And and the best chiropractors who understand correctional exercise, I know I do. I, they have the biggest. It's a scarcity bases. mindset. Yes, exactly. it's a scarcity mindset. And of course, it's not how Brink or Shallow think. It's just why we're good friends. I'll never forget when I first met Brink. Do you know the very first time we ever met? He showed up to one of our live events. I don't even know who he is. And he walked up and he introduced himself and he told me he was a chiropractor. And you know, what I told him I told him that I don't like chiropractors. Yeah. And he said, "Me too." <laughs> it was it was the best it was the best response you could have given me because at this point in my career I'd already been so many chiropractors would try and attach themselves because they have a personal trainer gets to train so many clients yeah. that it's like a great lead place for a lot of chiropractors and so I'd have a lot of, or in my early careers when I didn't know any early career I didn't know any better I'd have a lot of chiropractors that would kind of hang around me and my trainers and our businesses because they would try and pluck clients out of it mm-hmm. and if, so of course I have this kind mm-hmm. of chip on my shoulder about it already. So that's how I res- said that to Brink. But he had such the right response. Yeah, me either, because a lot of them are- oh, The first time I got a, a session with him, he didn't do a single adjustment. It yeah. was all assessment, correctional exercise. And movement, yeah. And movement. Yeah. That's, and, and, and those are the good, guy, the good people. They understand correctional exercise. They use adjustments as a way to help mm-hmm. correct the root cause. And the good ones grow their practices as a result. They don't lose clients because they solve- Well, the patients issues. learn something. I mean, yeah. at the bottom line, they're going in there, they're, you know, talking their way through whatever aches or pains, whatever. but the the point is like they're leaving with something that they can apply at home, yeah. not just getting there to get some temporary relief. Thank you. And I was going to say this, because the question is how often should you see a chiropractor? I'm going to give you some red flags instead. If you go in and all they do is adjustment and then you leave. And they want to book out your all your appointments. Red flag. Yeah. That's yeah. a big red flag. If you go in and they do assessments, they look at correctional exercise, watch how your body moves. They take you through movements and exercises to correct the issue. They're probably well. That's like going to, to a personal trainer to sweat and and get sore. Yes, it's very similar. It. The trainer that just moves you around. Yeah, you come back all haphazardly, sweat picks, and sore. Exactly. Well, that was an, another thing that I loved about Brink. One, I never ever once got on the table with him. He didn't adjust. He never had to adjust me. He watched my movement and then he gave me a prescription of things to do. Yeah consistently and then he didn't say let's book another appointment or let's schedule you twice a week for this long or with that he literally said to me like do these movements hit me up if you still are experiencing pain or if you still have discomfort or if you notice that yep. and then we'll go from there but that to me that is the sign of like a really good chiropractor is when they see you and they do a good assessment and they figure out what's going on mm-hmm. sure they adjust you to give you that that immediate relief but then they're prescribing to you things that you should be doing on your own if they're not prescribing for you to do anything on your own whatsoever they're then they're in the business of yeah. just adjusting you and having you come back every yeah, single week. i've been and that's I, a red flag i've been to i mean oh, quite a few where i'd show up and they you know, oh, your neck hurts. And they do crack, crack. Okay, we're done. Yeah, see you Wednesday. Yeah, and I'm like, okay, you know, and it, uh, I guess the I feel a little better. And they would come, me out. Yeah, yeah when I'd so see, loud. then I'd see someone who was really good and they'd be like, well, let me see you walk and let me see you stand and then pull your head back and turn over here and do this movement and then let's try this exercise and then you do this one for, you know, 15 minutes. Does it feel any better? Yeah, it does. Okay, let's start with that for now. And I want you to do this twice a week and then come see me next week and then I'm gonna try a different move. Like that's when... You know, you're working with someone that's good. So the question about how often should you see one? Well, if you find a good one that's as little good, as possible. it's whatever they tell you. That's the prescription. Whatever the prescription is, is right. If it's the, you know, oh, 10 minutes, here's your adjustment. Oh, good. You feel better. Then I'm going to, that's the person that you probably should never see. So it doesn't matter what they prescribe. Go the opposite direction and find a chiropractor that understands movement and correctional exercise. Next question is from Eric Nasser. Other than reducing the risks of metabolic adaptation, what are other positives of using calorie cycling? 
over the same caloric, daily caloric intake. Insanity purposes. Yeah. So, all right, so I'm going <laughs> to... So, so, so I'm going to... to eat the exact same thing. Well, so let me day. break down the question first Ugh. for people might understand. So uh, Simple, typical like prescriptive diet would have you eating the same calories every sa- single day, the same grams of proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, and in extreme cases, exactly the same food every single day. And uh, studies show that when you cycle the calories where there's higher calorie days, lower calorie days, ultimately equaling the same amount of calories at the end of the week, but it's fluctuating that that prevents or at least mitigates what's called metabolic adaptation, where when you're in a calorie deficit, when you're eating low calorie, your metabolism slows down to adapt. But if you do higher calorie and lower calorie days versus the same all the time, it, it reduces that effect. Which if you understand adaptation, I feel like this is kind of obvious. Yeah, yeah. it makes sense. I mean, the way anything your body get, if you want something that your body to get good at and adapt to, right, with anything else, it, you do you do it as frequent and as consistent as possible yeah. of the same. So it figures out, oh, he's going to do this to me every day in my workout. Oh, he's going to do this every morning, wake yeah. up at this time. And then the body gets really good at that and adapts. So why would we think it's any different than with the metabolism? If you eat the exact same way all the time before long, and the body goes, okay, yeah. this is how we're going to eat. Yeah, because they did the studies where they had what they would call like cheat days or whatever, where people would eat higher calorie days. And at the end, they lost more body fat than people who stayed consistent. And I think it's because the metabolism adapted less as a result. But the question is, what are the other benefits to doing so? Forget metabolic adaptation. What are the other benefits? Uh, well, I think the biggest benefit is not metabolic adaptation. The biggest benefit is it mirrors real life more. Yes. Psychological benefits. How, how are you going to go from a meal plan that has you eat exactly 2,000 calories, exactly 100 grams of protein, exactly X amount of grams of carbs and fat every single day? How are you going to go from oh, that gives to you then so much go more to flexibility? Yeah. Where are you going to go to normal life afterwards? Well, it also, make I mean, this, what I love about it is that, okay, it's uh, Friday night. I'm going to go to the, the Warriors game. I love having a hot dog or popcorn while I'm in there. So on Thursday or Wednesday, Thursday, I'm going to calorie cycle. I'm going to go lower so that when I go to the game, I'm not going, oh, punching in my phone. Oh, that's 200 calories from a hot dog. That's a, I'm going to enjoy myself. Yeah. And I'm going to have, and and know that I'm probably going to over consume on calories a little bit for the day, but I get to be a normal human being and enjoy a basketball game without freaking out. I went over my calories and all I had to simply do was adjust them the previous totally. day or two. Yeah. Cause the ultimate goal when you're, I guess, a coach or a trainer, the ultimate goal is you take somebody from this unaware state of diet to more awareness, which means they probably are going to follow some rules. They're going to follow some structure. And then eventually your goal is to get them to the point where they can lead normal lives where they're not necessarily following rules, but they have a better awareness, better connection, and they eat in a balanced, healthy way on their own. It's really hard to transition from same calories, same grams of proteins, fats, and carbs every single day, or maybe even same foods every day to regular living. It's easier to transition when you have fluctuations. When I say Saturday and Sunday, you like to eat more, you're going to have more calories on those days. Or what are you doing? Like like you said, oh, Thursday night, you're going out with your wife. Let's move these calories from this day into this day. And it's it's going to, it's easier transition into real life. Well, now on the counter to that, do you think there's some people out there though that have some bit of addictive tendencies uh, who are very much like control freaks? Like I have to have this the same exact way. And it like yes. gives them anxiety when you say that, yes. okay, now tomorrow I can go up this high <laughs> and then I have to jump back into like, you know, adjusting. Well, and those are the people I make do the most. You, right. And, and you, you do have to be careful, right? I think, I know we just said that casually, like, oh, just adjust my calories on it, Wednesday and it's Thursday. It's hard for people. Some there, yeah. people, okay. And the, I mean, you know, I consistently say on the show, don't eat like an asshole. But consistently, this is what happens to a lot of people is they go, oh, okay, I heard that on Mind Pump that I should fluctuate my calories. Wow, 7,000 calories on Saturday. Yeah. And, and so 200 calories on yeah, Sunday. Yeah. So then they, <laughs> then they just go extreme. Yeah, it's like, true. that is not the idea. The idea is that you don't have to be neurotic erotic about being so consistent every day. And so there's a little bit of this flexibility in your diet, but it does take a little bit of self-awareness to understand who are you? Are you still in this phase of, I'm still trying to figure out what a calorie is and what protein grams, fat, and yeah. how much, how I'm supposed to have. And right. I haven't even strung together a few weeks. Are of, you training consistency? Is that yeah, the highest like focus? If, so yeah. If you haven't been consistently eating well for yourself and training really well and you you're going into your second week of your first consistent week of being good and you're like hey i'm gonna do what the guy said and just kind of lower my calories on wednesday and then saturday i'm gonna enjoy the game like it's like and then you go crazy and eat seven eight thousand calories well, okay well you're not ready for that yet you know yeah. maybe you maybe you should eat 
a little more consistent right now until you've proven that. So it does take a little bit of self-awareness totally. on, on who you are, where you are in your journey with, with nutrition and exercise to, to whether how you take this advice now, or not. Now, I'm going to take this now a little more granular, uh, granular. So this is more for people who really know what they're doing, maybe more fitness fanatics. I think there's also value in cycling uh, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. I notice when I go, I'll have a low protein day or two. And low for me would be 50% of my body weight in grams. So if I, I weigh two, you know, about 210 pounds, so 105 grams would be low protein for me. High would be 200 or more. I notice when I have a couple low protein days and then I go back up to high, my body seems to be more sensitive to protein. And there's some studies that suggest may, this may happen. Bodybuilders have, for a long time also cycled carbs. And notice that when they cycle carbs, they get more sensitive to the carbohydrates, more athletic performance benefits, better pumps, and they get leaner easier. So I think there's more value to cycling your macros and your and your calories physiologically than just the metabolic adaptation. I think there's performance benefits as well um, that we may not fully understand. So for those of you that are like fitness fanatics and really dial this stuff in, Try that out and see what happens. Going low carb, higher carb, lower protein, higher protein, and even with fat. See how you feel. Next question is from Iowa West. What would your routine go-to workouts look like at age 45? You mean oh, like yeah. right now? Yeah. Well, I think most of us are getting, I'm the youngest and we're going to be 41, man, so, so I think yeah. we're all getting pretty yeah. close to I this. I think it's important to highlight what- Three years from now. Hmm. What we're looking at yeah. when we're talking about a 45-year-old. You either have the fitness fanatic who's 45 or the deconditioned 45-year-old, so the two different people, right? The fitness also fanatic- your goal, You're also your goals too at that time. Of course. Right? Of course. But So the fitness fanatic 45-year-old, they're probably going to have more wear and tear. There's more opportunity for crappy lifting or crappy training. There were definitely- there's definitely a decade of my training where I'm sure I, I did a lot of damage maybe to my body. So yeah. you got to take that into account. Someone who's deconditioned, um, at the age of 45, you start to notice a little bit slower recovery, I would say is probably the biggest thing. And then lifestyle. You're 45, you probably got kids, you probably got a mortgage, you got a job. So it's not like you have all the time and the sleep in the world to to dedicate to training. It's so those like, are the considerations. Yeah, it's just like anything else about being an adult at this level, right? Like you just, there's a lot more prep yeah. uh, that, that's involved. <laughs> like I've never had to like do mobility rituals and uh, priming uh, before workouts before. That wasn't even a thing in my mind. Uh, I would just get after it. And they're just things like that that I always have to consider uh, and making sure I have the an adequate amount of calories before I lift or it's going to ruin, you know, my entire workout. Like there's just things you notice like patterns uh, that uh, have definitely intensified over the years that I have to, you know, really consider how it's going to affect my next day and my next workout. Uh, so everything is, is a lot more thought out. You know, I, I, I'm going to speak to myself since I think there's so many variables on what this looks like, yeah. right? Like what, like you said, there's depending on their level, their goals, like, I mean, this could be so different for so many people personally. Uh, and I feel like I'm in the transition of this right now in my life of like, what am I, what is my, what are my workouts going to look like, you know, beyond 45, 50 years old going. And I think what it looks like that is different than what it has looked like in the previous decade is more flexibility on what I would constitute a workout. Right. So, you oh, know, yeah. the, the meathead guy who cares about it, the way he looks, which is was a major driver for me for most of my life, was all about my muscles, you know, what looks good and how lean or body fat or, where now it's it's not like that for me. Now I do it for staying healthy and flexible and strong and stamina and also how it affects my mood and how productive I am around the house and what a better partner I am. And so that doesn't necessarily require me hitting X amount of volume inside the gym. It actually requires me to do very, very little volume of strength training, like to maintain the physique that I worked really hard to get to. And so now like working out, you know, I may have planned like today's a lifting day, today's a leg day for me to train. Um, and let's say it didn't work out like, I would, it wouldn't be like I, it didn't work out. Maybe today I get home and instead I go for a two hour walk with Katrina, yeah. Yeah. you know, and that would constitute a workout where I wouldn't count that as working out or what that, or maybe I don't get to work out at all. And so I then really adjust the way my eating is. So I think just in, in, in 45 and beyond, I think there's just more flexibility in what, what I would consider, uh, you know, working out and stuff like that. And, you know, and then maybe, uh, 
my 45th birthday is coming up. And so I just have a personal goal of, hey, I want to look pretty badass mm -hmm. at 45 still. So I kind of ramp it up for the last two or three months before or dial the diet in any tighter, tighter just so I can say, la, cool, I look cool at 45. Yeah, that reminds me of a conversation I just had recently with my brother-in-law. And uh, he was kind of talking about getting back into it. But, you know, I just, I don't, I don't get what I used to get out of the workouts. And so he would decide to not do the workouts uh, in, unless he could do the full length of like an hour to an hour and 20 yeah. and like hit all the body parts and, and all that stuff. And I'm like, look, man, you have to totally look at this differently now. Uh, you know, there's, there's things that get in the way all the time and I've had to really um, focus on getting it in while I could, even if it's 15 minutes, uh, because throughout the day I can actually do that in chunks and it actually is just as good, if not better yeah. sometimes than doing a full length workout. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's alleviating a lot of the pressure around it and, and getting rid of the all in sort of mentality. Towards yeah, it. There's pros and cons cons. Uh, your, your body's probably going to take longer to recover. You're a little bit more prone to injury and you're more likely to have more solidified muscle imbalances or issues just because you're older. So if you've been moving bad, you've been moving bad yeah. for longer periods of time. What are the pros? You're wiser. This is true. If I work out with a 25-year-old or I work out with a 45-year-old, I mean, everybody's got an ego, but the 25-year-old is more likely yeah. to not be very wise. Whereas a 45-year-old goes, you know what, actually, uh, let's not put more weight on the bar. I just want to feel good right now. As a 25-year-old, like, I don't care. I just want to add weight to the bar and see what happens. So there's definitely pros and cons. Here's a wonderful pro for people who work out for years and years and years and then hit this age. It requires you way less intensity and volume to get your body to stay in shape than it does to get there in the first place. Like I work out now way lighter. In fact, I'm doing almost all machines right now because I'm trying to give my body a break and let my check my ego. So I'm working out getting a pump with machines. I'm using weight that in the past would have been a waste of time for me. Right now, I'm maintaining my physique because of the years that I have under my belt training. So there's a lot of pros there. You can also, you train smarter. I'll tell you what, a smart 30 minute workout is better than a dumb one and a half minute, uh, excuse me, one and a half hour workout. So there's a lot of, there's a lot that you could do with this. And I'll say this, I trained a lot of everyday average people. All of us did. My most fit clients, Okay. We're almost all in their forties, almost all of them. Now, is it because their age gave them an advantage and, you know, because they're no, obviously they're at a disadvantage compared to the 20 something or 30 something year olds that I would train, but they were smarter about it. They, they, they took more time. They were more off. They listened more in terms of mobility and correctional work. Um, and they were also had developed uh, discipline. They tend to de develop discipline or at least value developing discipline because, you know, when you're 45, you, you start to figure things out because you have kids, you work, and you're like, ooh, I got to have some structure because this isn't going to work if I don't have structure. And then when you go to work out, you're like, you know what? What worked with my kids and my job, I'm going to apply to this workout. I'm going to be smart about it. I'm going to do things the right way. So, you know, so there's a lot going for you either way. But yeah, I mean, you have to eventually change how you approach your workouts because, you know, 45, you start to feel it, 55, 65, 75. You can't have the same idea of what a good workout is because you're going to you hurt yourself. You, when, you're, when you're 20 something years old, you, you, you tend to kind of muscle everything or, or get through everything through motivation and push and drive. And I think in, as you get into your forties, you start to realize it's much more of a dance. You know, it's, it doesn't take, it's not, you start to cut out a lot of the fat. You don't, you don't, you realize that it's not as hard as it, as you, you thought it was. Like, I think I, I think I pushed myself so hard in my twenties and maybe early thirties trying to accomplish something or get somewhere and look back now and go like, man, that could have been a lot easier for myself. Well, yeah, totally. It could have been a lot easier if I would have just backed off this a little bit, increased that a little yep. bit more, focused yep. a little bit more on sleeping here, did a little bit. And I, I think the results would have came fast. And I think you through trial and error. I mean, and you would think because we're all professionals in the field that we should know better. Like we all started in this 20 years ago or more that you would, but no, even us, we, even with the education, the experience still had to learn the hard way yeah. of banging our head against the wall. And I think by this point in our lives, we've kind of figured that all out. It's like, and you know, that study, it was, it was so revealing to me when you shared that, I think it was earlier in the year about, you know, one seventh of the volume is required to maintain a uh, muscle. So it takes seven times more to build it and only one seventh of that to just 
to hang Isn't on that to that. And if you just think about that for a second, if someone did the exact same workout every single day, seven days a week for 20 years of their life, they literally can reduce that down to working out one day a week to maintain what it took them to build yeah. that. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. When you think about yeah. that. Now, there's that is, other additional benefits with being active every day, mental sure, benefits, all Sure, stuff. sure. But when it comes to what you're saying, I mean, I noticed that. I, I keep it. Nope. You know how hard it was for me to keep my body weight above 195 pounds when I was in my 20s? It was like, ah, now it's like I work out once a week and I stay that way. So yeah. it's a it's a big difference. But here's my favorite part about getting older. When I was a lean, muscular 22 year old, you know, I look different than other 22 year olds. Let me tell you, man, you put me around a bunch of 43 year olds now yeah. and I look way better. And that's only going to continue as I continue to age. So as you get older, stop comparing yourself to your younger you. Look at your peers. You'll blow yourself, you'll blow them out Just of the go water. To your high school reunion. Yeah. yeah. You have a real good time. <laughs> that's yeah. it. Next question is from Lindsay One Dove. Can taking painkillers before or after lifting inhibit muscle growth? Uh, yes, you can. In it's the it's NSAIDs. the NSAIDs, right? Yeah. The non-steroidal anti-inflammatories that will do this. Which is Advil, right? Ibuprofen. Yeah, so oil. ibuprofen, naproxen, uh, aspirin, I believe, is an NSAID, and I'm not. I know acetaminophen is not. That's a painkiller, but it works through a different mechanism. Um, but what they do is they block the prostaglandins that that. Uh, contribute to inflammation. So you get reduced pain and inflammation, but that's also a signaling process that tells your body to build muscle right. and to recover and repair things. So they've done studies where they show that regular use of these NSAIDs actually increases risk of muscle tear and joint uh, uh, problems, joint, joint degenera uh, degeneration, because it's blocking that inflammation the vital signal, signal. The yeah. vital signal. Will it reduce the muscle building signal? Yes. They also show studies that it reduces muscle protein synthesis when people use uh, ibuprofen, for example, post-workout or, or before. Now, it has to be pretty minimal, though, right? Because, I, I mean, I remember meeting lots of jacked bodybuilders that were popping painkillers on the regular. I don't know if they were popping NSAIDs. Well, they a lot were, of them Vicodin. Pop. Vicodin is a blend of hydrocoding and, and uh, is it aspirin or Advil? during or it's, after the workouts? No, that so so and so those are opiates. I don't think they block the the muscle building. Well, your signal. your your Vicodin has. Could you give me the blend, Doug? It's hydrocodone and and uh, is it Advil or aspirin? I think it's acetaminophen. That's it. Yes, that's acetaminophen it. is not an NSAID. So I don't know if that blocks the signal. But nonetheless, also consider this: uh, you're talking about bodybuilders probably have a loud, such a loud muscle building signal because of the hormones and stuff that they're on. Yeah, that whatever they're blunting with painkillers is probably it's not. It's going to get overridden. In other words, so I mean, I also know a lot of people that take a lot of Advil and stuff like that. So I mean, it can't be that. Is well, it? Do you think it's that big of a difference? I think it depends on like how frequent, yeah. like uh, the the pattern yeah. is, right? So yeah, if it's infrequent, obviously he's not going to do a whole lot. But uh, yeah, so the studies they would do it like before workouts every every uh, every attempt, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, so yeah, it's so hydro hydrocodone and acetaminophen. The amount of muscle. Okay. So there's no there's no NSAIDs. So in it, what's the that's the uh, the the pharmaceutical name acetaminophen? What is that a generic name? For Tylenol. That? Tylenol. Oh, so that's Tylenol. Yeah. yeah. So that's my. So, so, that's why they so Tylenol. Tylenol doesn't those. do it. No, but Tylenol, not great for the liver. Depletes the liver of glutathione. Oh, no, I'm, yeah, yeah. well, I'm also not. Right I, I, I just wanted to get clarity on that because I, you know, I've heard, general I've like, heard you bring that study up before yeah, and talk about NSAIDs. And I guess I was just under the impression that, that that Tylenol fell under that category too. So well, Tylenol does not, just, Advil does. Yeah, so just to make it, just so I can create context, uh, an ice bath after your workout will also block yeah. some of the muscle building signal. So, yeah. Anything that blunts or blocks inflammation will partially block the 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 signal that your body is sending that says, "Hey, repair, build muscle." Now, inflammation can also go out of whack in, in the other direction and obviously cause lots of problems. Right. I think it's really about how often you use well, it. Well, depends your desired and, outcome and what, yeah. what what level of inflammation you're experiencing too, or you might need to look at your nutrition and and like everything else in terms of what's contributing to like an excessive amount of of inflammation. Yeah, look, if I'm an if I'm training an athlete and it's we're in season, that's right, and it's important that they maintain their skill training because we're in season. That's the priority. Now we're going to, okay, and you want to use some painkillers so that you can move and you can continue to pitch and whatever. And then off season, we're going to figure out what the hell's wrong with your shoulder and fix it. 
and go off the painkillers and do correctional exercise. That would be the approach. Yeah, right your there. desired outcome at that point is to continue to play ga games, be yes. even though you got this issue going. It's not to build muscle, right? right. Like so, now, if you're somebody who is trying to build muscle, like say a bodybuilder off season trying to build muscle, not a good idea to probably be doing cold punches right yeah. after you get yeah. done with no, your do workout. Do them on the days after, the right. days in between, or do them in the morning. Do them before, not yeah. right after you send the muscle building signal by lifting really hard, yep. and then you blunt that by jumping. Now, in now a cold here's punch. the other thing too. Okay, um, how much of a signal does it blunt? Yeah. I mean, I don't remember what the studies show but it's not huge i'm sure over time it can yeah, it's just volume. it shows up but let's look i do a cold rinse in the morning before i come here now it's not the same as thing as a cold plunge okay but let's say i had access to a cold plunge oh it, you do it, yeah it, uh, well now we we <laughs> you're about to yeah so it, let's say okay i like the fact that it wakes me up it energizes me and i feel good during the day yeah. Am I willing to trade in a little bit of the muscle building signal for that? Yes, I am. Yeah, that's a I good totally point. am. That's a good point. Yeah, and some people are so obsessed with the muscle. Like when I was a kid, I thought any calorie burned would be a calorie taken away from muscle growth and recovery. So I'd literally work out and then try to lay in bed or, or sit on the couch yeah. as much as I could. Just let the muscles grow, right? What, what a stupid approach. Like I, I'm taking away the quality of my life for what, gaining another half pound of muscle, which by the way, actually doesn't work that way. Yeah. Well, actually, it's interesting because it's not yeah. common sense either because all we're getting, you know, in terms of like uh, marketing is to lower information by all means necessary because your average person, uh, let's say they're experiencing some kind of chronic pain or they're uh, eating inflammatory foods and they're just in this constant state of inflammation where they haven't really dealt with their stress levels yeah. uh, to that point where maybe it's not as beneficial just adding more stress and, and you know, the recovery side of it hasn't been at the forefront. So, you know, this is one of those things where it's like, what, where are you uh, in terms of your, your stress management, your inflammation levels and all that? I have a different conversation with you, you know, coming from different yeah. points. But if you have pain, and you're using painkillers, I mean, once a week or more every yeah, week. That's something you got to look into. Yeah, you got to figure out what's going on. Yeah. Why Why yeah. do I have to continue to use these painkillers on a regular basis? I know people who don't work out, right? I have family members who are older every day. Yeah. Every day they take- well, It's uh, prescribed to a lot of them. Yeah. Like that. A lot of people that have just chronic pain and you go see your doctor, you're 60 something years old. Mm -hmm. They don't be go- me like, when I had high blood pressure. I yeah. mean, I was just like, had headaches all the time and I had to take- uh, some Excedrin or some Advil just to cope. And then so. you lost 100 pounds, got rid of that. And then it was like <laughs> six-pack CD, what, dude. That's, that's not what it was. You had a, you had All a, you had to do is get rid of the painkillers. No, yeah, you, you had a, What was it, a benign tu tumor on your Yeah, uh, yeah, on your got adrenals? that all diagnosed and fixed <laughs> and surgery and now I'm back. I wish but, we had like a fake yeah. obese picture of Justin yeah, yeah, put up there when he talks mm, about his high blood pressure. You know? uh, I want to post a picture that Courtney hates that we used no, to No, don't do that. Oh, yeah. That one where he made himself I was like pushing it out and just like all Sad. Let's, yeah. let's bring that back. No, yeah, don't do good that. Times. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. You can find Adam on Instagram at mindpumpadam. And you can only find me on Twitter at mindpumpsal. 